1984, um, O'Brien, uh, who were also works at the Ministry of Information and is a member of the party, the controlling party of the state, gives Winston a copy of the Book of Revolution by, uh, by Goldman. And uh, Winston is also having an illicit affair with Julia uh, because sex is prohibited. Um, they have an anti-sex league. And, um, and so they're sneaking off into a room that they think is secure, but actually behind the mirror is one of the telescreens that's watching them. And he's reading in bed to Julia this book of revolution, which lays out exactly what happens in the modern warfare state, and that war is the health of the state, and that war is for profit, and to test scientific experiments, and you know all the different purposes it serves. Mm -hmm. when, when, when Winston himself is then captured there, and brought into the Ministry of Truth to have his cure, um, he finds out, among other things, that the Book of Revolution itself is written by the state. Um, and Orwell was a military intelligence agent for England. He was British Imperial Police in Burma, the first counterinsurgency war. And he certainly understood the dynamics of what he was talking about in the book. And the book originally is in England in its first printing was called 1948. It was only in the 49 printing by uh, Harcourt Brace in the United States that it was changed to 1984. And one of Winston's confusions in the book is that he doesn't know what year he lives in. Neither do we. Um, and we're following out patterns. I read the reread the book after doing 25 years of political research and saw 400 parallels of what was being talked about there, the aberrant conditioning, the telescreens. Uh, you know, the propaganda and everything else that inhabit the world of 1984. So uh, that's, that's really where we are, and we don't really know even if a war is going on or who's being involved in it or who our enemies are. And even if we could trace everybody involved in September 11th, uh, and they, I believe there's still many questions remaining about the evidence, and some clear attempt at false sponsorship evidence that was planted in front of our nose in such an obvious way that it was, you know, meant to lead back to these people, like flight manuals in Arabic found in the trunk of a car that was brought to the Logan Airport by four Arabs who had a road rage argument with somebody who therefore remembered them and brought the FBI back to the car. Um, I mean, in a Koran in there too, a guy the night before at a bar in Florida. Uh, paying for lap dancing, drinking, and leaving a Koran on the bar, and threatening that America would see blood the next day. Um, everywhere these people went, they caused problems. The FBI was called about them. The CIA was called about them when they were living in Langley. They were making a spectacle of themselves. And it reminded me of the Oswald double at the firing range several months before the Kennedy assassination in Texas, who shot at the other guy's target. And when the other guy complained, said, the hell with you, I'm Lee Harvey Oswald, remember my name. And of course he did. Um, that's what these guys were doing. And they were using false IDs that came out after the 19 names were printed, that, that uh, uh, seven of them at least were still alive in Saudi Arabia and Egypt, you know, that these were stolen identities. And um, so, but even if they're all Al-Qaeda and they're all part of bin Laden's network, because bin Laden was financed by U.S. intelligence, Pakistani intelligence, and Saudi intelligence, we don't know who the ultimate sponsor of this event really is. And, um, you know, his, his hands aren't clean. There are financial ties between his family and the Bush family, between the bin Laden's construction company and the CIA uh, in Saudi Arabia and the, and the region there. Uh, between the Carlyle Group, which is a huge multi-billion dollar investment group that included up until recently both the Bush and Bin Laden family, the father works for them, Bush Jr. invested in them, um, and the Bin Ladens were bought out in the last few months for image purposes <laughs> because they were making it too evident. That, but Carlyle's invested in, among other things, Bioport, uh, which is the company that's getting the big contract for the anthrax vaccine. The whole anthrax scare that followed September 11th uh, is, it's clear now chem chemically that this is AIMS, what they call AIMS strain, uh, 
anthrax, which means it comes out of the United States, and that's its genetic, and, and its engineering is such that, uh, that it, it's clear that it had to have come out of Fort Detrick or U.S. intelligence uh, labs, uh, that it's U.S. military anthrax. And so the question is who had their hands on it or could have gotten hold of it, and where did it go? I mean, that's just the simplest question. If this was anthrax from the Al-Qaeda network, who's carrying on the war? Who, which party is in power in the United States? Who stole the last election for the president? Who, what party is running the war against the Al-Qaeda? Is it the Republicans? And who got the anthrax envelopes? Senator Leahy, Senator Daschle, the Democrats are the biggest opponents to the Republican domestic agenda? Why did the envelopes go to Bush's enemies? if it came from the people that they're supposedly fighting. So these, these are just simple. I mean, the guy down at the laundromat asked me that. <laughs> you know, I mean, this isn't rocket science. I mean, and, and you get to a point where now, uh, I've got one article that says the FBI sus suspects the CIA. <laughs> I mean, that's how split they are, that the FBI's main suspect is the CIA. I went back to September 1st before I came out here to Seattle to talk about this and tracked my email article collections, because I get articles from researchers all around the country, just from September 1 to September 11 to see what was there. And among other things that's there is the fact that they're making an announcement from the Pentagon that, uh, that the Defense Intelligence Agency, the DIA, which is bigger than the CIA and the FBI combined, are working on the next generation of anthrax weapon. And there was also an article that broke September 4th and 5th in the New York Times and the London Sunday Times about Operation Clear Vision, uh, which was right on the edge of violating international treaties about uh, chemical weapons, where the U.S. was creating an anthrax bomb to see if it could smuggle it in. Uh, they claimed it had no detonator, no anthrax. They were testing whether they could buy at commercial places a chemical lab to create anthrax, put it out in the desert, uh, and also Rumsfeld ordered a, an, an attempt to genetically change anthrax so that it would be resistant to the known antibiotics. And all this was covered under defensive operations that they were supposedly trying to defend themselves from, you know, an external anthrax attack. Um, the, the interlink of the Center for Disease Controls, which is supposed to track morbidity and was set up in the 1950s to see if chemical biological attacks were going on by Russia in the United States. It has such a crossover of personnel and everything else with its Fort Detrick and the center of the creation of the biological weapons here that they're almost indistinguishable and that you really can't trust that one is regulating the other or isn't part of op internal operations. So we don't know who we're at war with. But ultimately the problem is, is that we don't live in a democracy. We don't live in a situation where we can get the kind of information we need to make reasonable decisions. And Bush, from September 11 forward, and his administration have been pushing for total secrecy. Secrecy of evidence, secret trials, secret tribunals, you know, secret military operations abroad. No one can know what we're going to do. It's all going to be done in our name and for our good, but we're not allowed to know anything about it. He wants now to change the rules so that he, the the papers from his father's presidency and Reagan's presidency will never be released. Um, the Freedom of Information Act, which is futile enough, but I mean it got a little bit out. Ashcroft made a public announcement that if any agency was having trouble with an FOIA request that they'd put the full weight of the Justice Department behind that agency to keep the secrets locked. Well, you know, I was part of a, an effort that was successful in the 1990s finally uh, in getting a law passed, the JFK Assassination Records Act, which bypassed the F FYA because we proved to Congress that the FYA was useless. From 1964 till 1994, we were able, under the FYA, to get maybe several thousand pages of records on JFK from the various agencies. Once we created the Independent Review Board and the Independent Review Process of the JFK Records Act, from 1994, when the board was finally created, the act was passed in 92, but it took us two years to get the board appointed because both Bush and Clinton sat on the process. But once the board was appointed from 1994 to 1998, in those four years, six million pages were released and more continuing to be released, the largest release of classified documents in American history. 
because we took it out of the hands of the agencies and we reduced the excuses for, by which they could, could uh, contain the information. And nothing is withheld. Things are only postponed for release until 20, 2011 or 2017 or specific dates. So it's a much better law. Other groups want to adopt the law and we were heading in that direction. Our next goal was to get the Martin Luther King files out under similar and the COINTELPRO files. So, and, there were, and we had actually planned a panel about that at the Congressional Legislative, Congressional Black Caucus Legislative Session. And it was happening September 28th and September 11th, and then everything was off the, off the boards. But we need to go back to that before Co COINTELPRO is reinstated and the spying on civil groups and, you know, protests and religious groups by Ashcroft. We need to go back and actually get loose the horrible history of counterintelligence program or COINTELPRO that the FBI ran you know, from, from the 50s forward. Military intelligence has been spying on U.S. civilians from World War I forward. There was a guy named Vandemar whose files became the basis of Hoover's files. Hoover had records. At one point he said there's 200 million Americans. That was back then. Um, we have dossier on 150 million. We have to close the gap. Um, the secret files of the U.S. military are in a military archive, classified records from World War II to the present, in Suitland, Maryland, outside of D.C. They have underground buildings that they store these files in. They are an acre in size, each building. There are 27 of them. Those are the classified military records since the end, end of World War II. Well, including World War II, but World War II forward. Okay. I mean, the amount of, the amount of stuff that they're classifying every day still is, is more than we've ever been able to release. And we live in a national security state where secrecy is the mode. And, and Kissinger said, to history to be successful must be conducted in absolute secrecy. And uh, history the way they want to write it, of course. But if we want a democracy, we have to throw that up when we have to throw up in the media. We have to claim back the flag. We have to say, this is our country. This is being done in our name. We're going to live with the consequences of it just as we're living with the consequences of what was done in the last 50 years without our knowledge or assent. And we want to know what it is, and we're going to decide. It's our military. We're going to decide how big it is and what function it serves. You know, and we're not going to sink trillions and trillions of dollars into these operations that don't protect us and that don't inform us. Of course they had knowledge beforehand. Not only did they know the method, not only did they know the... the you know, the group that, the, that, the, that, the, that was involved in doing the operation or appears to have been, but they had warnings from Israeli intelligence, from German intelligence, from Russian intelligence that an attack was coming, the timing of the attack, you know, that it was going to be a big event. And they had plenty of foreknowledge, and in fact, bases went on alert the night before. There were national alerts called around the same time. There's indications that certain people were warned not to get on flights that day. So at least a segment knew it was coming, knew when it was coming, and knew what it was going to be about. And as I say, at least in D.C., where we had the time to respond, did nothing and stood down and let it happen. But the war that we're in was planned much before that. And in July, Colin Powell went to Afghanistan, well, he didn't go, he went to the surrounding countries around Afghanistan. He went to India and Pakistan and Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, and he told them that the United States was going to militarily intervene against the Taliban in, in Afghanistan in mid-October. So that war, the 10-year war, was already in process and known about and planned and, and alerted before September 11th. So September 11th is pretext. It's not cause. You've got to reverse those. And it may be that the warning ahead of time, which certainly at least through Pakistani intelligence would have gotten into Afghanistan, might have triggered September 11 in the same way that the boycotting of the Japanese oil triggered Pearl Harbor. The one may be that it's the reverse cause. We don't know. But that's the problem. We don't know. And Martin Schott said in his book, History Will Not Absolve Us, has a very good quote, and he says, the problem in America is that we are allowed to believe anything, but we are allowed to know nothing. And when you can't know, you can't act. You can't decide how to act when you can't know. 
And so you can believe whatever you want, and they'll spin a million theories out there for you. You know, I mean, if, if you think I'm a conspiracy theorist, I'll document to you sometime all the garbage conspiracy theories that come out of the intelligence agencies, you know, and all the disinformation. I mean, I wrote an article about it after the movie Conspiracy Theory with Mel Gibson, where I, I said not all conspiracies are created equal. You know, and there's a whole lot of garbage out there about, you know, the Illuminati, uh, the Eastern Establishment, the Trilateral Commission, and the New World Order being the only thing on the agenda, totally ignoring the Pentagon and the military-industrial complex and the southern rim economy, focusing only on the Rockefellers and, you know, that end of the money. Uh, that's the old John Birch Society stuff. Um, but, and just total nonsense stuff, including UFO conspiracy stuff, um, you know, and just all kind of garbage that's put out there in order to, in order to muddy the waters. But we have to know, and we have to take responsibility, because now the whole world is involved in a, in a war, in a global exchange, and it's destabilizing the world. And we may have been rearranging the rubble in Afghanistan and hiring half the Afghanis to kill the other half, but we see one of the consequences is that we almost came to a nuclear war between India and Pakistan, you know? And that's why I say we can't play this way. We have to go the other direction. Martin Luther King said it, and he was absolutely right. The choice is not between violence and nonviolence. It's between nonviolence and non-existence. Talk again about the anthrax situation, because that got a lot of coverage for a while, and then it seemed to drop off the radar screen. Well, anthrax, of course, is a natural um, you know, biological entity. I mean, it occurs and has occurred, especially in farm communities. Uh, it tends to infect animals and then sometimes gets crossed over to humans. So there's already a certain level of anthrax death in any society. Um, the, the problem in the modern world is that uh, because it's fairly lethal, um, blood disease, uh, uh, people saw an ability uh, to develop it into a weapon, a biological weapon. And, um, and so it, it was used um, uh, historically. There, were, there was actually a plan near the end of World War II, which uh, wasn't carried out by the, by the British, to take uh, anthrax and put it into little pellets and then drop it uh, over uh, German agricultural areas where there were cows hoping to infect the cows in there and through that to infect the German population. And it got far enough that it was, you know, developed up to the level of making these pellets, but then apparently at least, or, you know, according to the story, they weren't dropped. Uh, there was a lot of biological warfare that went on during World War II and was hidden. Um, one of the most famous instances of that, and its repercussions are, are very long-lasting, was, uh, was chemical and biological warfare that was done during the Korean War in the 1950s. And they were, they were very anxious to keep it quiet. Um, and so when the international press began to pick up on claims of it and canisters were discovered in, uh, of the, you know, the agents that didn't, didn't explode uh, and Korea tried to make it public what was happening, uh, the U.S. was into denial mode, as they often are. Um, and three journalists here wrote a book about the evidence. And Eisenhower not only stopped publication of the book, but he charged them with some sort of treasonous activity of federal law and put them into prison, um, you know, for a period of time in order to hush this up. Uh, of course, among the people that knew about it firsthand were pilots who were dropping these. And some of them were captured as prisoners of war. And during their interrogation and time as prisoners of war, some of them admitted that they had been dropping chemical biological weapons. So that was sort of an ultimate proof that they couldn't weasel around um, as easily because the pilots themselves had admitted it. And so they sent in two psychological experts to interview and debrief these POWs when they were released. And that was a guy named Robert J. Lifton and another guy named Jocelyn West, and both, one from the Air Force and one from the Army. And um, both these people have rather illustrious histories, uh, and I believe both sinister histories, although one's considered to be a liberal good guy and the other's considered to be a 
rather nasty mind control researcher, but I believe they're both on the same page. So they came up with this idea to cover the story that the Koreans had engaged in some sort of brainwashing. And uh, Lifton actually wrote the first book about bra brainwashing techniques, as it was called. And, um, and then that story became the basis of a rationale for why the United States had to have the capability to do brainwashing and mind control in reverse and became the philosophical basis for getting approval for MK Ultra and the study of mind control for a long time, all coming out of covering up this initial lie that we had used chemical biological weapons. Jocelyn West went on into doing a lot of experimentation with LSD and other drugs uh, out at UCLA <coughs> and uh, was part of a plan to actually develop an isolated camp at a Nike missile base to do direct mind control and all kinds of methods including surgery and psychosurgery and other things that got revealed uh, when the funding went out of Reagan's uh, administration there to a guy named Stubblebine and they were bringing in these doctors from Boston who had done brain implantation on veterans and uh, they had this whole idea to like really perfect the methods but it, it blew up in the press, there was a student movement to stop it from going forward at the school. And it was at that point, I believe, that they took the captive population because the target groups were elderly women and children, the potentially violent elements of the society. Well, those are only potentially violent elements in terms of the patriarchal male rule of the society that realizes that they've been oppressing them and that they might figure it out and rise up. Most people in the society don't look at the elderly, the women, and the children as being the potentially violent elements. So it's got to be only those that are conscious that they're making them violent, you know, by the privilege that they're maintaining over them, that would consider them as such. But this was the study, and uh, they wanted to isolate them out of this base and, you know, do their experimentation. I believe they moved that captive population out of the institutions then under the control of Jim Jones into Guyana and uh, Jonestown and I did a great deal of work about mass mind control in Jonestown uh, and that that's really what was going on there, that this was a, a mass mind control experimentation that they had moved from individual level to field level. And the fact that they would do that is evidenced early on, 1954, when Alan Dulles, the head of the Central Intelligence Agency, purchased 100 million tabs of LSD from Sandoz Chemicals after it was originally developed. Well, that isn't field test level. I mean, that's, you know, it's like individual testing. I mean, you're going out to 100 million tabs you don't need to experiment with. I mean, you're going to use it on a, a you know, on a larger scale population. Um, so, I mean, right from the start, they obviously had grandiose plans about altering human consciousness and still do, I believe, and continue this kind of research. But it had its roots in a lie about chemical biological weapons, and anthrax was one of those that was developed. These weapons were developed in secret, huge caches of weapons, especially at uh, Fort Dix and Fort uh, Detrick in Maryland where they did the experimentation. Dix was a storage center. And some of the current modern plagues, if you trace them back, broke out at these centers. Um, and, uh, you know, among servicemen first and then spread out into the general population. Uh, there have been spills. There have been, you know, incidents with the stuff. The stuff was eventually supposedly all destroyed under Richard Nixon. To give you an idea of the scale, though, I mean, I saw a report just recently because anthrax is back in the news about how much anthrax they had worked to destroy by that point in the, in the 1970s, but they were talking about tons of anthrax, like two and a half tons of anthrax powders. Well, I mean, a very, very small amount of powder is lethal to a very large population, so I mean, this is like multi-overkill to have tons of this stuff. And, uh, and yet, of course, obviously, they kept other uh, amounts of it, you know, backed up and, and stored still to this day, maybe not at that volume, but it was there. The American study of anthrax, uh, the definitive study began at Ames University um, you know, as an agricultural threat and how to deal with it. And Ames at the university at the labs began to collect all the various strains of the anthrax as it went through its mutations. And this Ames strain, which is specifically an American strain, uh, could then be tracked back wherever you have an anthrax outbreak, you can go back and find the genetic strain of where, where it came from in the first place. 
it's not impossible to create anthrax sort of in a home lab, but it won't be what they call weaponized anthrax. The anthrax that's developed uh, for the purposes of weapons is put through another process that makes it uh, electromagnetically sort of less uh, gummy or packed up, like they don't want a snowball, they want a snowfall, and so the, you know, they want the particles and little uh, you know, individual anthrax spores to spread out, and so they, they have processes that freeze dry them or do different kinds of things with them and add electromagnetic charges to them so that, so that they're what they call fluffy. Uh, you know, you, you drop it in the air and instead of it all just clumping together, it's going to spread pretty effectively over a space. And um, there are different methods for doing this. The Russians did some of it. Iraq allegedly has done some of this. But when this anthrax scare broke out, uh, and they actually put the biochemists on the job at the FBI and elsewhere in the labs, they discovered several things about the anthrax that was in the envelopes. And it, it was weaponized grade. It was very fluffy. It was like extra fluffy, especially the stuff that went to Dashiell. It was almost sort of a step above what they had known before. And it was AIM strain, which means it came out of the United States. And at least the last public FBI statement about where they were looking outside of for the disgruntled, you know, loner nut, you know, the Oswald description, um, was that the, 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 they said in the paper that the FBI's suspect was the CIA. And uh, they specifically said that the weaponizing related back to anthrax that would have been at Fort Detrick. So it's our anthrax, whoever's spreading it. Now, who has access to that? Are we talking really about a disgruntled employee? There was one Arab scientist there at Dietrich who was singled out in an anonymous letter, but the letter apparently has handwriting similarities to the anthrax itself, so there's some thought that the person actually doing the anthrax or persons were trying to pin it on this particular scientist when he's not actually the one involved and figuring that the ethnicity would probably feed into that. Um, but it's definitely an inside job, and it's a job that aimed not at Bush and the Republican Party that were carrying on the war, but at their main domestic opponents, Senator Daschle and uh, Senator Leahy and the people that had been right up to September 11th really blocking the Republican uh, domestic agenda, uh, which was being discredited and uh, it went into the recession. And Bush's ratings were falling off. He was not getting stuff through Congress. Um, so all of this new sort of pseudo-unity that's developed since, and it's starting to erode now, um, really was a way to reverse that trend, or they hoped so with, uh, you know, with the events, whether they created them or not. They certainly used them uh, in a very aggressive fashion in order to restore their credibility and capability to control the society. So one strange thing that happened, and it was reported in October, uh, right before the outbreak of the, uh, the main anthrax, I think the first incidents had happened, which went down to the first incident, you may remember, was at the headquarters of the tabloids that they sell in the supermarkets. And I thought that was very strange, and I even thought that the story was invented because the tabloids are, are under mafia ownership, and they're also used by the intelligence agencies because they're much more read uh, than the New York Times or the Washington Post. I mean, they far outstrip. I mean, if a million people read the New York Times, 10 million read the tabloids, or 20 million. So they really are mass consciousness publications, and they can put whatever they want in there. And in fact, the CIA has a history in other countries of creating these kind of publications for the sole purpose of spreading disinformation or like, you know, sightings of the Virgin Mary telling you to, you know, get out of the communist areas of the country and blah, blah, blah. So they're a propaganda device. They're owned by, you know, the dirty money and the and money that relates to the intelligence politics. So I thought, well, this is perhaps a planted story in the first place. Um, but then, you know, that was just the first report. Then the guy actually died from the anthrax. And I thought, like, well, you know, something actually is going on. Um, so what's it about? I mean, not that they wouldn't sacrifice a particular person, but I found out that that person was a photo editor who had been responsible for printing in the tabloids the first picture that got out of the arrest of Bush's daughters on the alcohol charges. And uh, it may be that that's why they singled them out, as well as to get the bonus of it being reported in those tabloids, which gets to a very large audience and scares a lot of people. Um, 
Then it went to the major news media, but again to the liberal newscasters, you know, or relatively liberal, like Brokaw and, I mean, all of them follow the general agenda, but I mean, you know, it went to, you know, and then Rather was threatened. And so, you know, it wasn't Fox News that was getting it. I mean, it was <laughs> what remnants there are of liberalism in the, in the media were getting the packages. And then when it goes into the Congress, it was hitting the, uh, you know, the offices of the people that were opposing the Republicans. So it, um, it had a strange history in that way. But in October, they reported that, I think it was after that first incident at the tabloid, but before the major news media incidents broke, the FBI had been in contact with the Ames Laboratories and had given a green light to the Ames Laboratories for destruction of a, an archive of these vials of anthrax and their genetic development and strains that de dated back to the 1930s, 70 year, uh, you know, archive of information about anthrax. Now why on earth would you destroy that? You know, and then to destroy it in a timing period when it becomes critical, because then it eventually did come out that this, that this anthrax in the envelopes that they discovered was Ames strain and could have been traced genetically back to the particular batch that it came from. And then where that batch was sent, what lab it was weaponized at, I mean, all that would be traceable. Now it's not. And, uh, and so it, it's a destruction of a baseline of evidence critical to the case with FBI approval, you know, right at the time that the story is breaking. So I find that very suspicious. And I uh, don't know who authorized it or what it was about or why. I d can't imagine that the university on its own just said, well, we need more space and we're going to get rid of this archive that we've kept for 70 years. I mean, I think there was obviously pressure put on them to get rid of it. Um, but we still don't know where that came from. We don't know if or how it relates to the other terrorist stuff, except that it's part of the overall package of frightening people and making people afraid of, you know, a postcard from Aunt Minnie. I mean, I went down to get my box mail during that period, and uh, somebody walked in. I mean, I was almost startled because they were wearing a bandana over their face, gloves on their hands, you know, just to get their own mail, you know. And, I mean, I don't think, I mean, you know, you're talking about five or six letters out of, you know, hundreds of millions of letters, if not billions, so... I don't think it's something that, that you have to concern yourself with that much, but of course if you're a postal worker, it's a different picture because you're more likely to be handling all the mail, but the individual odds, you know, that some mail's going to pass through you. But the spores do spread, and they still haven't completely cleaned out the, uh, the buildings, you know, uh, the congressional buildings from what was there before. And um, they were able to save most of the lives. Some of the postal workers died. But... Um, no, I, I think this has, again, earmarks of being an intelligence operation and an inside job um, with American-made weaponized anthrax. There was also articles uh, September 4th and 5th in the New York Times and the London Sunday Times about a CIA project and then also a DIA project relating to anthrax. And Rumsfeld had ordered the DIA to develop uh, anthrax uh, up to the next level like to genetically modify it and make it more lethal in terms of being resistant to antibiotics. And uh, they were saying that this anthrax was, n was that, that they found in the envelopes was at a weaponization level that was exceeded, like it was a next generation weaponization. It was fluffier than anything they'd ever seen. It couldn't have been Russian because of, because of the details of it. And it couldn't have been from Iraq, which they originally were trying to blame it on Iraq, and these elements like uh, Woolsey and others from CIA that want to go into Iraq uh, wanted to blame it on them. But uh, they, the chemists, again, saved the situation by doing just basic scientific work, and all of the Iraqi production anthrax, its weaponization leaves a, an aluminum trace, and there wasn't any in this. So little by little, I mean, actual science eliminated, you know, what, what political science won't. Um, and luckily, I mean, we got, they must have contracted it out or something because also that can, of course, be messed with. And there's a big scandal about the FBI labs themselves, you know, over the years tampering with evidence. And I, I'm sure that the books that are coming out now about the people at the FBI labs, if you went into the backgrounds of some of the ones that have been there for 30 or, or 40 years, that you'd find people that messed with the Kennedy assassination 
evidence in the, you know, in the 1960s because they just keep them around. I mean, if it ain't broke, you don't fix it. But I, you know, I, I think you've got to have some questions about this anthrax thing and its timing and whether it was meant, again, to just further terrorize the population. Um, unduly so, but uh, the whole theme is, are you scared? And if you're scared, then you stop being rational about what options you choose. And you start looking for somebody to protect you. You start looking for revenge against those that are supposedly attacking you. When you're scared, it's easy to scapegoat people, um, you know, and to, and to manipulate you. And so my message from the mid-90s on, when I saw this pattern of strategy of tension and terrorism coming on, was calm down. Calm down and be rational. And when these things happen, take a step back and try and look and see what the source is. The solution can't be to try to imagine the worst possible thing that can happen in every aspect of the society and then build a fortress state of security in order to make sure that it doesn't happen. You can't live that way. You're going to exhaust your resources. You're going to make society and social interaction untenable. You're going to ruin the economy, except for the economy of security agencies, you know, and intelligence agencies and the Defense Department. But I mean, you just, you have to find another way to normalize international and human relations, establish some kind of justice, restore hope for people, and uh, because there's no reason not to go in the other direction at this point. And once you do that, these little elements that want to blow themselves up or something are going to dwindle to nothing, and they're not going to have any support. And they're not even going to have support among their own members because it just, it's just, it's a silly way to go about anything. I mean, what does it accomplish? You know, and, um, but, you know, it's just day after day we hear, you know, oh, there's con so many millions of containers coming into this country. We have to devise a system so each one of them is safe. Or what about the drinking water? What about the nuclear plants? You know, everything's up for grabs. Well, I mean, it's up for grabs also in the sense that there can be disasters with or without terrorists you know, and have been disasters. And how you go about designing things, you know, has to change. It has to take into account the local situation. It has to, has to be done democratically. It has to be talked out and everybody involved and get the right information and make rational decisions, not decisions behind closed doors by a few people about what the society is going to look like or how it's going to be, all for our benefit. You know, I'm much more scared of that than I am of what a terrorist could do to me. And I know in my life, in terms of the kind of society I live in and what I've been forced to be afraid of, that the real terrorism stems from the control of the state by the national security forces and what they're doing, you know, the genocide that they've perpetrated around the world since the end of World War II. That's the terror that you have to be afraid of not the little remnants of packages of people that may be responding to it at a particular point. Which isn't to say that there wasn't a tragic loss of life in, you know, in New York and in D.C. on that date. I mean, there was. But lives are lost every day all around the world. And, you know, I know that in the American consciousness, because of the way the media is, only American lives count, only American lives are thought of. We might get to hear about lives from an earthquake in Ecuador, you know, being lost and, you know, you get a figure and you cluck your tongue. But, I mean, in the, in the end, I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's an imbalance that says that, you know, when an American life is lost, that's worth more than any number of lives that are lost on behalf of American interests someplace else. It's that empire mentality, you know, of like the Romans, you know, one Roman killed, I mean, is worth, you know, killing a hundred Visigoths, you know. And uh, the Nazis had the same mentality, you know, you kill one of our Nazi guards out in the, you know, hinterlands that we've taken over, we kill the whole town in retaliation. Um, but that's, that's not a mentality that's, that's healthy for a society. And um, we've got to see all human life as valuable and, uh, and start from that. You know, we've been in a mentality of me, mine, and the hell with you. Uh, Kevin Dodd. Danaher of the Global Exchange says that the, the, the paradigm for the last, you know, 5,000 years is accumulation of material wealth 
and um, and uh, God is on our side, and um, and you know, and it's it's got to change over now to to us and ours, and how can we cooperate? How can we use the resources that we've got to let all of us live lives, you know, of plenty? And it isn't for lack of, I mean, we're in the surplus technology period now. It isn't for lack of the ability to do that. It's lack of will and common sense. And, and, and ultimately, it's in all of our best interest to make that kind of a world rather than a world where a few hoard the, the bulk of the materials and others suffer because eventually that privilege is the violence that's done at the deepest level and it's going to come back and be expressed as violence and rage in other ways you know that, that are harmful and there's no need for it there's no need for us to be violent with each other or to establish privilege over each other that's all just uh, all human relations and human institutions are arbitrary you know they have histories but they're all open to change and our own lives are open to change and um, the only real limitations that we have are, you know, time in the sense that if we don't start doing certain things now, there's going to be long-term consequences and, um, and imagination, intelligence, you know, to do it. But I think those are, those are limits that can be overcome, you know. Uh, if, we want to, if we want to go that direction, we can build and think of another kind of world. And... Uh, it's just obvious to me that, and should be to other people, that this kind of world is not working. And to just have this lockstep response, well, they hurt me, so I'm going to hurt them, on into the rest of what's left of human history in that direction. As Martin Luther King said, you know, if the theme is an eye for an eye, then you're going to live in a land where everyone's blind. And um, there, isn't, there isn't any revenge, there isn't any closure to violence. You take the violence out on the other person, then you live with the consequences of it. You never get that closure that you think you're going to get. And people are beginning to understand this. I mean, I was encouraged by the fact that families of some of the victims on September the 11th, both Twin Towers and in the Pentagon, families of people in the military, were saying, we don't want a war done in our name, in the name of our family member, to revenge this. There are many people who are saying, you know, if if I'm killed, I don't want the death penalty to be used in my name. And, uh, you know, it's a rising human consciousness that you don't get closure by revenge. Almost seems like something we could put on our licenses, like you're an organ donor. If I'm killed, I don't want the death penalty. Yeah, people penalty. do. They have little things they sign. Right. And, and they, you know, there's a national register, and then they sign it, and it says, you know, don't kill for me. If I'm killed, I don't want somebody else killed. So, but these are conscious choices, and um, you have to have the wherewithal to make them. And if you just live in fear, you live in ignorance, you live in, in alienation and disconnection, and, on, and your whole framework is to scrabble to get what you can for you and your immediate family at the expense of whoever that is, you know, then you know, you're going you're gonna to be trapped into these situations that produce violence. Um, but if you pick up a gun now in the 21st century, I believe you lack an imagination. Um, you're also not going to win. The violence game has already been won by the elements that you know, are in charge, and you're not going to play it out against them. You have to find a way to use your heart and your head and develop a different kind of game. And I don't say, you know, nobody will get hurt, but people will get hurt either way. And taking the other direction, taking the direction of what Gandhi called Satyagraha, or truth force, um, uh, allows a different kind of future and does allow a resolution. It does allow a way out of hell. Um, maybe not everybody gets there, but more get there than, than if you go the other direction. And the, and the hell doesn't continue on into human history, on into the next generation of weapons, and mass destruction, and terror. 
you know, what's the point? And we can play this game to say, like, well, those people are evil and I'm good, but all of us have the same evil and good in us. Uh, there's not, to my view, no such thing as an evil person. Evil and good are choices that each of us makes at each juncture, you know, in, in our existence. And they have consequences on us and, us and all the other people around us. But in, in, the, in the end, the only rationale that really holds for violence is that if it's not just simply revenge, is this idea that there are people who are not like us and who cannot change and that will not stop being violent unless we're violent with them. And therefore, there's no way, because they're so different from us somehow, there's no way for us to reach them, and there's no way for us to change their consciousness. And since we can't change their consciousness, then the only option we have is to kill them or, you know, blow their brains out, basically. But that's, a, to me, within the reality of the human experience, a defeatist concept, and it's a concept that really allows any suicide or murder all those things stem from a basic philosophical idea that you can separate your human experience from someone else's. Those are also the, the, the basic philosophical underpinnings of racism, of sexism, of any of the isms, the beliefs systems that are based on the idea that you can divide the human community into groups. You can divide the human experience against itself. Uh, that you can say, well, people with this color skin are different than people with this color skin. And the difference can not only be asserted, but it is the basis on which then those people, different than us, not us, can be, their labor can be exploited, they can be killed at will or harmed with impunity, they can be sexually exploited, uh, and, they, and they can be oppressed. And they can be put into a position of, you know, relative uh, social, you know, disadvantage in the society and not treated as, as whole people. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's a, essentially an anti-democratic and anti-human idea, but it's, those underpinnings only come when you can assert that there are people somehow so completely different than you that their human experience is so completely different than yours that you disconnect from them, and therefore you can treat them as something other than the way you would treat yourself or others that you believe to be like yourself. And it's only when you yourself can separate your own human experience from others that you could possibly kill yourself or kill anyone else. Because the natural understanding is that we're all connected, which we are. I mean, and not only our lives, but the, the life of nature and everything else that's around us. So you have to disconnect, and then in that disconnection you can come to this conclusion that well those people, those people only understand violence. That's the only way to get through to them. Which is in nonsense. I mean, it just in reality isn't true. But it's it's a common rationale and until we instead have the imagination and have the moral courage and have the the willingness to take the other route and to say, No, I can reach them. I mean, my really immediate response to this is if this came out of Afghanistan, we should just take two million Americans and go over, normal American people, and sit down with the Afghanis and have a discussion. Because I'm sure we could work something out. If this is in fact coming from what we say it is, if it's not just a few people that are being put up to it, but it's an actual social or political or economic phenomenon of a group of people or a society, and those societies could sit down. Not the leadership, the people. Okay. And that's the difference. And because the leadership have a vested interest in another kind of game that keeps them in power, that escalates, you know, that they get social hegemony and control out of warfare and out of, you know, pitting people against each other. But uh, I don't know if you ever read Johnny Got His Gun, but uh, it's a Dalton Trumbo novel that he got in trouble for. Uh, later during the McCarthy period, and he wrote in World War I and the period after the war when the anti-war sentiment was pretty strong. It's about a guy that goes off to war from a, you know, normal working guy, works in a bakery, and 
he goes off to war and he's in he's in a trench and a bomb comes in and blows him up and he survives but he survives without the bulk of human senses he loses his eyes he loses his mouth he loses his nose he loses his ears he loses his limbs so he's a torso and he has something left of his head but the only thing he's got is skin sensation and you go through this consciousness in the book where he doesn't know if he's dreaming or awake, he doesn't know if he's alive or dead. He eventually dis discerns that he's alive and, he, and then he can, by feeling heat and cold on his skin, he can discern the passage of days and time. Um, you know, he has some human touch because there's a nurse that comes in from time to time but he doesn't know where he is. And eventually at the end of the book he, de he determines that because he knows Morse code that he can tap out messages in Morse code with his head on the pillow. And so he shows them that he can communicate, and they all come in. You know, there's some doctors around or whatever. I mean, and he senses that there's other people there. And so the message that he sends to them is that he wants out. He wants out of the hospital, and he wants to go out into the world again and be among people. And, you know, in, in his ideation, he's saying, well, you know, and you don't have to support me. I'll find a way. He said, I'll be a circus freak. I'll be, you know, I'll do whatever I have to do, but just let me out of the hospital because I'm just in this stasis here, in this limbo. And they tap back on his chest, no. And then he's, the, the very ending of the book is his transformation of consciousness, like why won't they let me out? And then he realizes that they won't let him out because if anyone see him, and, he, and, and they've actually been keeping him not in the general ward but in a broom closet, hidden, because he says if they see me, I'm the future of war. And if people see the future of war, they won't fight. And so they can't let me out because people will see what comes of them. And, and then the last little bit, the last two pages, is this amazing sort of consciousness change for him and where he says, well, go ahead then. Make your slogans to make the world safe for democracy. And by God, we will. And he said, not ten of us, not a hundred, not a thousand, not a hundred thousand, but millions of us. Because we don't want to fight that other person who has a family, who just wants to live his life, who wants to do his work and be part of the human community. And you pit us against each other. So make your slogans and hand out your guns and we'll turn the guns around on you. That's how the book ends. And, uh, you know, it's a very powerful anti-war message. And, um, Donald Sutherland read the ending of it at this thing, FTA, um, was a troop that went around, um, uh, they called it Free the Army, but it really they had a second word <laughs> they used for it. Um, but it was Jane Fonda and um, uh, Holly Near and Sutherland and some others, and there's some footage of them, and they went and actually entertained troops during the Vietnam period at, you know, rest recreation bases. So sort of there were an alternate USO, but that was one of the things that he would read the end of Dalton Trumbo's book to the GIs. And, uh, you know, I think we have, to, we have to transform our consciousness in the same way, not in the terms of picking up a gun, but in the same way that he finally realized what war meant and what part he played in it and that to play along, to keep going along, just perpetuates, you know, the wars. And I grew up in a generation where consciousness did change and a war ended. It wasn't the war in Vietnam because that was planned for 10 years and they carried it out for 10 years and they killed as many as they wanted to. It was a war, my mother told me after she retired, a war into Laos, into Cambodia, into the broader sector. That was the war that we brought an end to but there would have been more. And, um, and we established the idea that the word bad and the word war could go together in a sense. That was not the case, you know, especially with the good war of World War II, but even most wars were just considered good things. You know, and they've been working hard to get us back to that point. The Gulf War was about that. But the only way they can get us back to that point as a society is to have wars that are so technologically devastating, they're like the new Blitzkrieg, that they don't really involve any troop deaths. 
They just go in and, you know, obliterate the enemy and do it within a few days. And they, that's the way they, they train them for like three to six day wars at West Point now so that they can get the war over with. And um, the first stage is you get the Allies behind you. The second stage is you carry out the war in a brief period and smash your way to victory with all your super weapons. And then the third stage is you do the cleanup, take care of any problems you have with the Allies afterwards. And, you know, establish the new order there and put in the peacekeeping troops or whatever. Um, of course, it's never as clean as they envision it, but that and the control of the media, the control of the propaganda, and the distances of the, of the wars from the public consciousness makes it easier each time to try to get back to getting rid of what they call the post-Vietnam syndrome, you know, where people question wars or don't think that it's such a good thing, you know, or you're with us or against us. You're a traitor, you're a, you're, you're a terrorist too if you don't go along with our war against the terrorists. But, uh, I, you know, I think that if you really get down to it and you want to fight a war against terrorism, then you have to dismantle the machinery of terror that is our military and the militaries around the world, these weapons of mass destruction and this whole approach of using military and war to resolve national or international problems. This attack had the elements, because of the scale of it, of an of attack of war, but it was not war. This was a crime against humanity. It was a mass murder for political purposes. It's defined in every international body of law as a crime. Every country that has any of that and signed on to any of that, you know, recognizes it. There's a procedure where you approach the countries and they turn over people for interrogation and suspects. There are international tribunals, ad hoc international tribunals that can handle this, like Nuremberg. Um, this is how this should have been treated from the beginning, as, an act, as, as a criminal act, not, a, not an act of war. And it should have been handled not with a rule of force, but with a rule of law. And um, we had, on September the 11th, the absolute moral authority of the whole world behind us to take that route and to show people that we were something better than, which was the theme of Nuremberg. We're not going to, we could do, we could go out and shoot these Nazis now, but we're not going to stoop to the level that they operated on. We're going to uphold a higher level. That was the theme of Nuremberg. We're going to take them to court and give them the due process they wouldn't give other people. 